Hi, I'm the History Guy, and in addition to my page on YouTube, I also have a page on Patreon where for just a dollar a month you can become a patron and help support what the History Guy does. And as a patron, one of the things that you will get is access to one patron-exclusive video a month, which for the last year has been a series on the History Guy's hats. Occasionally, when we're traveling, we bring to you an older one of those episodes. If you enjoy today's episode, please consider becoming a patron. This is a British policeman's helmet, or sometimes called a bobby helmet, but in England the proper name for it is a custodian helmet. It is traditionally worn by male constables and sergeants on foot patrol in England and Wales, although it hasn't been used for many decades in Scotland and Northern Ireland. Female constables don't wear a custodian helmet, instead wearing a type of bowler hat. This particular example of a custodian helm is a relatively new pattern. It comes from the Dorset Police. The badge on the front is a Brunswick star. It's surmounted by the royal crown. It has the royal cipher of Queen Elizabeth II. This one has a crest style top. This is actually a vent for the hat. Inside you'll see it's got two different kinds of straps. It's got a simple strap that you might wear for normal duties, but it's also got a more robust strap that's got a chin strap that you might wear if you're doing something that's more strenuous where your hat would be likely to be knocked off your head. And either of those, both of those can store up inside the hat because many constables for normal duties wear them without any sort of chin strap at all. While the design has changed a lot over the years, some version of the custodian helmet has been used by British police all the way since 1860. Three. It's become really the symbol of British policing, and it's one of the most recognized hats in the world. But if you want to understand its history, you have to go back all the way to 1825 and the founding of the Metropolitan Police Department, which was championed by an extraordinary politician of the day named Sir Robert Peel. A rising star of the Tory party, Peel first entered the cabinet in 1822 as the Home Secretary. There he engaged in a number of criminal justice reforms, including a series of acts consolidating and simplifying criminal law called Peel's Acts. In 1829, he proposed and shepherded through Parliament the Metropolitan Police Act. Peel's vision was to standardize policing and making an official paid profession, to organize it in a civilian fashion, and to make it answerable to the public. Although the Metropolitan Police were not the first professional government police force in the London area, the well-regarded Thames River Police had been established in 1798. The act replaced the poorly organized system of local constables and private watchmen that had previously tried to maintain law and order in Greater London. The act was then a model for policing throughout England. The 1829 Act established the Metropolitan Police District, which included the greater area of London, originally a seven-mile radius of Charing Cross, excluding the city itself, which had its own police force. The new force was headquartered at 4 Whitehall Place, but had a back entrance on a street called New Scotland Yard. Scotland Yard quickly became the common name used for the force. The Act then provided for the appointment of a sufficient number of fit and able men to act as a police force for the district. These constables were empowered to apprehend all loose, idle, and disorderly persons whom he shall find disturbing the public peace, or whom he shall have just cause to suspect of any evil designs, and all persons whom he shall find between sunset and the hour of eight in the forenoon, lying in any highway, yard, or other place, or loitering therein, and not giving a satisfactory account of themselves. In the act, Peel had standardized and provided better funding to what had previously been informal practices. The approximately 1,000 policemen hired under the act were, in homage to Sir Robert, called Bobbies, a name still used for British police today. While there was initial resistance, the Metropolitan Police Force became a model throughout Great Britain and, combined with other reforms, significantly reduced crime rates. When designing this force, Peel thought it was critical that the officers be easily recognized and yet distinguishable from the military. Thus they were given a uniform, a blue swallow-tailed coat, in contrast to the red worn by the British military, white trousers and a black top hat. The idea of a uniform served a purpose, but it was intended to be functional, with the coats deliberately having a high collar, for example, to protect the policeman from being garroted by a criminal while going about their duty. The hat was also functional. Not only was it easily recognized, but its height added to the officer's stature, making it easier to intimidate the criminal element. What's more, the hat was reinforced with cane. While it appeared simple, the hats were actually made to be strong enough that the officer could place them on the ground and stand on them in order to, say, peer over a tall fence or help to climb over a wall. Originally, the police did not carry a firearm, but were armed with a wooden truncheon and a rattle they could use if they needed assistance. The original pay was a guinea, about a pound five, a week. That wasn't high, but it was enough to attract quality recruits. 
Policing continued to develop and modernize throughout Great Britain. An 1835 Act required all incorporated boroughs in England and Wales to have an organized police force, and by 1857, all jurisdictions in Great Britain had an organized police force, for which the Treasury paid a subsidy. But there was trouble brewing, in a near literal sense. Sir Robert Peel's top hat was, according to the constables and sergeants of the force, unbearably hot. The first alteration came in 1844, as described by the Cambridge Independent Press. The commissioners of police have decided on an alteration in the hats of the police, which will be immediately adopted throughout the force, and which will tend materially to add to the ease and comfort of the men whilst on duty, especially in hot weather. The alteration was to add a perforated button to allow airflow through the hats, offering more cool-headed police. But the top hats were still problematic. They continued to be too hot, especially in summer. They were heavy, especially at the top, which made them not only uncomfortable, but also meant that they were easily knocked off if the officer got into a row. By the 1860s, the Metropolitan Police Force was searching for something new. In here, there is a bit of a controversy. Some sources claim that the new police headgear was influenced by European military design, such as the Prussian Piccolob or a Dragoon helmet, which tended to have a large coxcomb. While you will see this claim repeated in some literature, it is most likely incorrect. The reason to question the claim is not just that the new hats had a clear evolutionary similarity to the old top hats, but because the design is actually rather familiar. Although there are no known remaining examples of the original design for the English police helmets from 1863, the design as it evolved very much resembled the sun helmets used by the Indian military. It is clear when you see the sun helmet designs from early as 1840s that the coxcomb on the British police helmet was not a decorative embellishment like the spike of a piccolo by the crest of a dragoon helmet, but a ventilation pipe. The fact that the concern was heat makes the sun helmet as the genesis of the design even more likely, as the purpose of the sun helmet was to offer a lightweight head covering to protect the wearer from the elements. Unlike the myth that is popularly repeated, the custodian helmet likely had nothing to do with European military helmet designs like the piccolo. Over time, the design changed, with quite a lot of development of the height and shape of the hat. Some retained the comb or crest, others were topped by a rosetta or even a spike. Different jurisdictions adopted a number of different faceplates, but the general appearance, very reminiscent of tropical sun helmets, remains to this day. Similar designs have been used throughout the Commonwealth, especially in Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, but also in places like Bermuda, Jersey, Guernsey, and the Isle of Man. Their use in Jersey and Guernsey, which were occupied by Germany during the Second World War, resulted in the odd juxtaposition of an English bobby next to Wehrmacht soldiers. In some jurisdictions, white versions were used in summer. Similar hats were commonly used in the U.S. during the latter part of the 19th through the early 20th century, and police directing traffic often wear a white helmet of similar design in many parts of the world. One significant change that has been made, however, is clear in the example that I own. Originally what was known as the custodian helmet, and that term actually referred to a specific model and is therefore only used to refer to English helmets, were true pith helmets. They were constructed of cork. While that makes a lightweight helmet, it offers no ballistic protection if an officer was, say, attacked or had objects thrown at them. In the 1970s, the hats were changed to be made out of a stiff plastic covered in felt. This helmet, in addition to being recognizable and providing protection from the elements, offers the officer real protection if someone tries to club him over the head. Today, British police have riot gear that was actually designed for NATO that they would wear if they were, say, trying to control a riot, but the custodian helmet is still good head protection, and it's typically used when you're doing crowd control that's short of a riot. For example, controlling a football crowd. I would, of course, be remiss in talking about the custodian helmet without reference to one of the most famous photographs of the 20th century. On April 20th, 1974, during a rugby match between England and France, a 25-year-old inebriated Australian accountant named Michael O'Brien ran naked onto the field during halftime in front of a crowd of 48,000 people on a bet. The act was seen as the start of the modern prank called streaking. While O'Brien merely came out even, the fine was 10 pounds, the same amount he had won in the bet, he was the focus of one of the most famous pictures of the last century. A freelance photographer named Ian Bradshaw took a photograph of Police Constable Bruce Perry covering Mr. O'Brien's modesty with his custodian helmet. The photo was chosen as World Press Photo of the Year, was named Picture of the Year by Life Magazine, and Picture of the Decade by People Magazine. I can't show you the picture, it's Mr. Bradshaw's property and I wouldn't violate his copyright, but do yourself a favor and look up Ian Bradshaw's The Twickenham Streaker online, it's well worth looking at. Mr. O'Brien later regretted his stunt and Constable Perry in an interview years later said it was a cold day, he had nothing to be proud of.
<laughs> the custodian helmet used to cover Mr. O'Brien's bits became so famous that it now resides in a museum. There have been recent attempts to retire the custodian helmet, which has been phased out, for example, by the West Yorkshire Police Department, except for ceremonial occasions. However, attempts to replace the traditional headgear with baseball caps have not always been successful, and its recognizability is unmatched. The Thames Valley Department phased the custodian helmet out in 2009, only to bring it back in 2018. Despite its venerable style, many see the custodian helmet as still being practical. In 2015, the BBC quoted one former police officer, saying that the custodian helmet not only offers the officer head protection and protection from weather, but that its height and prominent badges give the officer presence, which can be important when enforcing the law. As of today, 39 of the 43 forces of the Metropolitan Police District are still using the custodian helmet. This custodian helmet represents over 150 years of British police history, and I am proud to have it in my collection. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe.